Creative Babble. I'm Neil McTai. And I'm Javier Leva. And this is the Ponzi Playbook. Neil, you and I met maybe like, what, a year ago? Has it been that long? Actually, it's been less than that. But when you meet somebody and you feel like you're kindred spirits, I guess it adds time. Yeah. And we hit it off right away. And you had no ambitions whatsoever of being a podcaster, right? No. And in fact, I would say, Even today, my only ambition is to talk about these incredible topics, these incredible stories. That's why I'm here. Podcasting is the vehicle. I want to tell the listeners about the first time I met Neil. We met at a pizza shop here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And this is the first time I'm meeting this guy. We've always exchanged emails and texts or whatever. I'm meeting him for the first time. And he hands me a Tumblr, a random Tumblr. And I'm thinking, what is this? And he goes, this is from a Ponzi scheme. (laughs) And I just thought that was amazing. That's when I first realized that this guy is obsessed with Ponzi schemes and financial crimes, right? Absolutely. And it's not like I have millions of those Tumblrs sitting around. So I was very deliberate. And I said, you know what? I have found somebody who is obsessed with con artists, fraud, and I didn't really have anyone to speak with about it. So giving you that Tumblr was sort of like, oh my gosh, another one of me exists in the world. (laughs) And I discovered your podcast through LinkedIn and dove right in. But just getting in and starting to listen to your podcast, it just excited me. And I said, I got to meet this guy. And to find out that we lived in the same city was the icing on the cake. And since then, we've become friends. We share stories and things that we catch in the news. And it's just been fun to get to know someone like you and learn a lot from you, too. It's just the whole idea for this podcast came from all the text messages and emails that I get from you. It's like, hey, check this guy out on LinkedIn. This guy is working a Ponzi scheme right now. You're not just obsessed about Ponzi schemes that happen of guys have been busted in jail. You have like a knack for spotting them as they are trying to lure in their victims. And it it is incredible. And so that's why I was like, we need a podcast about this. And Ponzi Playbook, man, what a great title, right? It just tells you everything you need to know about the podcast. Absolutely. And and hopefully our listeners aren't going to be inspired to go out and create a Ponzi scheme because they're learning all of the, the X's and O's in the playbook. But It is true that that's where the interesting stuff is happening. And that's where we're going to dive in on this podcast. That's what I envision here. Well, we're not giving away the secrets on how to create a Ponzi scheme, but if you know the way they work, then you know how to avoid them when you encounter them, right? That is very true. And unfortunately, as you can see, if anyone were to just simply go to the security and exchanges press release feed, every week they're announcing litigation often unsuspecting to the perpetrator or the alleged perpetrator at that time and the victims, sort of an intervention to stop a scheme that's ongoing. If you ever dive into that, there is a scheme going on in cities across the country. And we all know somebody, whether we want to believe it or not, that is conducting to some varying degree a financial fraud. That could be somebody who's just I only take cash. I don't report my income. All the way through complex schemes, like some of them that we'll discuss on the Ponzi playbook. And that's why these are such difficult cases to prosecute and to prove guilt. And oftentimes why they don't even result in criminal charges because intent in fraud is very difficult to demonstrate. Yeah. And we have dozens and dozens of cases. And at first I was thinking, could we possibly make a podcast out of this? But no, there, like you said, it is every day there's a a new one out there. And we're going to be talking about the cases that you haven't heard of. Those are the most interesting ones because everybody's heard of Bernie Madoff. Everybody's heard of, of, you know, Charles Ponzi. And, but we're going to talk about some really unique stories. Don't expect this kind of banter on every episode, by the way. This is just to introduce ourselves. So why don't we just jump in there, Neil? Like, let's take it away. Let's do it.
All right, Javier. So the other day I met somebody and he pitched me this really interesting investment opportunity. And if you had a minute, I'd just like to share it with you. Oh, man, I can't wait to hear it, man. Hit me. Hit me. What do you got? All right. So this sounds really, really good. Basically, so the guy's name is JP Maroney. And, you know, he comes off. He's really confident. He knows his stuff. So he basically generates leads on the internet and he then sells those leads to companies. And the miracle of this whole thing, at least as the way he's described it, is that you invest a buck and he can turn that dollar into $4 almost instantly. Oof. Wow. And then what kind of business is he in? Yeah, it's a little confusing, I suppose, but at the <laughs> same time, it's generating leads through kind of advertising traffic. So he's online kind of building funnels and then he captures people's emails, phone numbers, names, addresses, and then goes off and sells those in kind of bunches to uh, companies who then try to sell, you know, things to them through email campaigns and direct mail. Yeah, that makes sense because, you know, I work in marketing and advertising and there's two ways to build leads. You could either Build it from the ground up, generating leads yourself, or you could just go to someone and buy those leads. So, yeah, I can see how that could be a a very lucrative business. Yeah, it piques my interest. And I think what piques it even better is that he is providing his investors 12 to 18, sometimes even 20% sort of fixed income yield a year on their money. So... I'm not a financial guy, but that's unheard of, right? It is big time. I mean, if you look at like the S&P 500 or just parking your money in a 401k, I mean, this is doing a lot better. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm feeling like I'm going to do it. You know, maybe (laughs) put 100 in, 100k and see what happens. Now, the truth is you didn't have dinner with JP Maroney and you're not really going to invest money into this company, right? Oh, no, no, that would be a very bad idea. And I'm happy to tell you all the reasons why. All right. So now we know that this company, you know, this JP Maroney guy and his company, Harbor City Capital, might be a Ponzi scheme, right? Uh, Yes, it just might be. Uh, Harbor City Capital, Javier, you wouldn't know it on the outside, but once you uh, start digging on the inside, it has all of the signs of a Ponzi. Oh, man. You know, it sounded too good to be true. Yeah. 18% returns, maybe 20%. You know, all you have to do is give him a buck and he'll turn it into four uh, miraculously, you know, as if uh, it's that easy. So do you want to know, you want to get into the details about how this scheme worked? I want to know everything about this company. (laughs) Well, I'm the one to tell you because I've dug deep on it and here's the deal. Okay. So Jonathan Paul Maroney goes by JP, founded uh, basically a company called Harbor City Capital down in Melbourne, Florida, or also known as Harbor City, back around uh, May of 2015. He was able from May of 2015 through April of 2021 to raise $17.1 million through, frankly, YouTube videos and social media. Wow. He's just a really good marketer. That's a lot of money. You know, to do that for a legitimate business would be really a, a big accomplishment, right? $17.1 million. Absolutely. And that's just raising money, right? Just going out and asking for investor capital. So on the back of all that, he's saying, I'm 4Xing that in terms of revenue. So that's 17.1. Presumably, his business is generating seventy million. And I want to kind of talk about this from a financial sense. I mean, is that possible without the Ponzi scheme part of this? Is that possible for a advertising business generating leads or collecting leads to get a four time investment on every dollar? Is that possible? I don't think it's impossible. But the beauty of the question that you just asked is is that all you need to do is make somebody believe that it's possible. And that's what (laughs) JP is so good at. So if you dig into this beautiful archive of his YouTube videos, 
you will just see a master salesman, right? Somebody who will make you believe that, hey, I can take that buck, turn it into four bucks. And the beauty of it is, is that I can pay you a massive return because there's still so much profit left over for the company to grow, to make money for all of the, not only the investors, but myself. But what, of course, the investors didn't know is that all of that was a sham. Yeah. Why don't we listen to JP kind of sell this company, sell Harbor City Capital? Let's play a clip. I was so, so hoping he'd do that because he really is a master salesperson. I was actually out walking the dog after I watched this TV show, and I was thinking about the return on investment that we get in the digital space, basically buying leads or generating leads online. We'll buy traffic or advertising online and send people to a page and generate a lead. And a lot of times, the money that we make off of that lead can be a two to one, three to one, five to one ratio on those dollars. And so I was thinking, wouldn't it be cool if you could take the money that you're able to make, the return that you're able to make on digital advertising or generating leads online and combine that with the power of an investment fund well, you would have something really powerful. Then you would be able to go out and buy every single click or every eyeball related to that particular offering. Javier, that was a fantastic clip. I mean, we've saw the master in action right there. <laughs> He's good. He's good. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that Maroney, why he's so good is that he didn't just go ahead and say, hey, write me a check for 100K pull it out of your retirement account and I'll start paying the interest payments every month. What he did was is he gave this air of legitimacy to all of the investment products by using, you know, typical investment language or even sort of traditional banking language or debt language. For example, he would call the investment products as, you know, providing promissory notes or unsecured promissory notes or fixed rate funding agreements. Another one he used, which was particularly alarming when you look at it through the lens of a Ponzi scheme, is he sold the investors what he called were high yield secured bonds. These had interest rates varying from two to five percent per month for terms ranging from 12 to 36 months. When you hear that, Javier, what do you think? I mean, do you feel like you're safe? Well, you know, that was my question to you because I am a journalist. I cover con artists, but I'm not a financial expert. So when you use terms like promissory notes, unsecured promissory notes, fixed rate funding agreements, high yield secured bonds, they sound legitimate, right? For a novice, right? Correct. Yeah. And that's all that he needed, right? On, you know, if you're scrolling through YouTube, you're sitting around going, I want a Ferrari one day, but this is just not cutting it. And you run across JP, who's confident, smart, and speaks the language of investment products. You can get easily enraptured. And certainly when you hear something like a high yield secured bond, two things that are usually antithetical in the investment world, high yields usually are ascribed to high risk products. Not necessarily, but you know, 99% of the time, it's, that's the case. So putting high yield and secured bonds together is particularly attractive. And you know, that was his great way of ensuring that he was getting more and more cash to feed the Ponzi. While he's doing that, Javier, what do you think he was doing with the money? Oh, well, you know, he's probably buying a yacht or a fancy car and living the life, maybe. I think you're right. Uh, in <laughs> fact, if I were seeing that kind of money legitimately, I'd probably be doing the same thing, but he's doing it illegitimately. And at some point, that's what happens to all Ponzi's. Ponzi's are not situations of frugality. So nobody's sitting there saying, let me defraud people and pull in a lot of cash. And I'm just going to hunker down and drive my 20-year-old car here and live in my modest home. So you're going to burn that cash on luxury items, luxury homes and vacations and things like that. And, you know, I sent you over a list. Why don't you yeah. give our listeners a rundown of how Maroney, and not just Maroney, Maroney's wife, 
spent that money. Yeah, well, but Neil, they have to live a little, okay? I know, you know? I know. I don't blame them for that. Look, I mean, the guy, is, you know, he has expenses, maybe $1.3 million in credit card bills. I mean, you know, we all have a little debt, right? Yeah. He had, let's see, $827,000 for and maintenance of his waterfront home. I mean, you know, these waterfront homes aren't cheap, okay? But then on top of that, he had to spend another 800000 to renovate the place because it was a dump, you know? But then the $90,000 for the Mercedes or, you know, the $265,000 in cash withdrawals or he also deposited $394,000 to his wife because, you know, happy wife, happy life, right? <laughs> and... <laughs> Uh, and she's racking up some credit card oh, bills. Yeah, she has too, no yeah. problem with this. I mean, yeah, it's just so she, working out nicely. Yeah, she has like sixty thousand dollars in credit card bills, and they have like you know another six hundred thousand dollars in unrelated entities. So I mean, these things add up to four point four eight million dollars in personal use. But hey, whoo! So we started with seventeen point one million. And then that's just what he's diverting, right? So he's got to make Ponzi payments because yeah. he's not generating leads. He's not actually running a legitimate business. He's taking new investors' money and he's delivering it to prior investors to make those interest payments. And we already know they're massive interest payments because he's promising high yields on those secured bonds. Yeah, and then when people say, how do you sleep at night? I don't think it's because of his conscience, but can you imagine how does he sleep at night knowing that he has to juggle everybody's money like this? So we all know that every great Ponzi scheme has an epic crash. And Neil, how did Harbor City meet its doom? Ooh, well, I love that question because this Ponzi scheme was brought down by a whistleblower. So on October 10 of 2019, the commission in Alabama, the Alabama Securities and Exchange Commission, received information regarding a YouTube advertisement. Maroney working his best selling this product on YouTube. And that information led to a cease and desist order. So they basically got a tip, did some research, and then issued a cease and desist order against Maroney. Once that cease and desist order was out there in public record, so what do you think happens after the Alabama Securities Commission issues its cease and desist? Do you think the United States Security and Exchanges Commission just sits around and uh, says, okay, you got that? No, I would imagine the federal government caught their attention. That's for sure. Yeah, it caught their attention. And once something kind of hits, you know, the press and, you know, the public's purview, the SEC feels a lot more heat and they need to take action because they're frankly inundated with a lot of whistleblower tips and accusations. Uh, it's hard to figure out who's committing fraud and who's not. But what does the SEC do? They follow up with their own civil lawsuit against uh, JP Maroney on April 20th of 2021. Six counts fraud and one count for the sale of unregistered securities. And let me tell you, Javier, this story gets much more interesting. You want to know? Yeah. I mean, come on. Listen, the only reason people are listening to this right now, hanging on at the edge of their seat, is because of the title of the episode has someone who's been in the news lately, right? George Santos. Yep. George Santos. <laughs> George Santos, that's not the name he used when he worked at Harbor City, right? Nope, nope. Actually, a lot of our listeners probably, they've been following uh, the George Santos story, and they might even know it's DeVolder. That's his name. Mm. George DeVolder, later Santos. Before he was a U.S. congressman, he was a successful Ponzi schemer, right? And a lot of people, there are so many lies surrounding George Santos. That this one, which is like a pretty serious one, gets lost in the whole scheme of things, right? You know, Javier, the big question is, is was he a Ponzi schemer, right? That's true. 
it's hard to peg that one. There's been no complaint filed by the SEC against George Santos to date. There certainly has been plenty of opportunity to investigate him. As we know, the SEC filed a suit against Maroney in April of 2021. So the question is, is do they just not have evidence of his conspiring in the Ponzi scheme? Was he unaware that it was a Ponzi scheme? That's what he's claiming. Why don't we play a clip of George Santos, I mean, sorry, George DeVolder selling Harbor City? Currently at Harbor City Capital, I manage a $1.5 billion fund, right? And I know how to manage it well. I give record returns um, to anybody who watches this. They'll understand I'm, I'm giving, you know, a 12% fixed yield income return a year, which nobody in the market's giving four, and we're giving 12. Uh, we're also giving up to 20 to 26% in IRR return on our investors' capital. Neil, you bring up a good point. You know, it maybe or maybe not. I don't know if George Santos knew what he was doing, right? But he was definitely working for Harbor City and he was also pretty much selling this investment to other people, right? And other people fell for it. Whether he knew that this was a Ponzi scheme or not, I don't know. But he was definitely the face of the company for a while, right? Yeah, he sure was. And I did some digging and I, I put together a little bit of a timeline and there's definite evidence that he was making misstatements knowingly to potential investors and actual investors. But let me give you a little bit of the timeline. What do you think? Would that be good? Go for it. Yeah, man. I really want, this is what's great about the show is that for the first time ever, we're really going to zero in on this part of George Santos' life. So hit me. All right. So basically, George Santos, we don't know how he meets Maroney. Okay. But we know that he's down in Florida. He's traveling in the same circles and they meet up and obviously they hit it off. So Maroney gives Santos the opportunity to open a New York City office of Harbor City Capital. And that is February of 2020. So here you have George Santos. He's working for Harbor City, and he's the face of the company in terms of the New York office, establishing the New York office and kind of getting all the status that comes from being in a high rise in New York City in Manhattan. It seems like they're in, in the right place to meet new investors. But tell me about the people that George Santos personally approached and got them to invest in Harbor City. Oh, I've got two really good ones for you. And one of them in particular, I think, Javier, is illuminating in that there is evidence that Santos was making statements after the Securities and Exchange Commission had filed its complaint against Maroney. So at this point, Santos is well aware that there is a lawsuit against Maroney. So I'm going to tell you the story of Andrew Intratore and also the story of Tiffany Bogosian. So let's start with Andrew, okay? So Andrew is this very wealthy businessman. He's adamant Trump supporter, but he's also a believer in George Santos and Santos's political aspirations. Santos, also a strong Trump supporter, meets Intratore at a Trump event. And at that time, He's already working for Harbor City. He is working for the Ponzi scheme. So he goes up and he's ready to sell the investment opportunity to this wealthy businessman. Intratur then says, okay, good stuff. Let me write you a check. Let's get this going because I want to get those big returns too. So ultimately, Intratur invests $625,000 in Harbor City. Whew. Yeah, it's a big number. I mean... I'm sure the guy is rich, but I mean, $625,000 for even somebody who's wealthy, that's a big chunk of change. That is a big chunk of change. And especially when you start thinking about, he's investing this money at the end of the Ponzi scheme. So mm. he's not about to see years of fake returns. He's about to lose it all. Here you have George Santos. He's getting an investor. And like you said, at the tail end of a Ponzi scheme, which is like the most dangerous time to invest in a Ponzi scheme. But what do we know about 
Santos and his culpability in this whole thing? Like, do you feel like he did anything wrong? I absolutely believe that George Santos knew that he was doing wrong because he made certain statements to Intratur. For example, he said that he had raised $100 million for Harbor City Capital. We know that's impossible because J.P. Maroney and the Ponzi scheme all in was $17.1 million. So how would that possibly happen? Additionally, he made statements to Intratur in May of 2021. So this is right after the SEC complaint. When Intratur is now nervous and he's looking for some sense of security from Santos. So he's communicating with Santos. Santos promises Intratur that, oh, you know, all was issued, sent over, you know, there's this letter of credit, you're safe, everything's going to be good. George Santos knows that he's providing false information to Andrew Intratur because he's making these statements in May of 2021, which is after the SEC filed its complaint. He said that the investment was safe. He said that it was secured by a standby letter of credit, but those things never materialized because they never existed. So Andrew Interter, we know he was approached by Santos. He invested a lot of money and lost all of it, probably, you know, investing in Harbor City. But who else has George Santos, a.k.a. George DeVolder, approached to invest money into this company? I have another great story, as I alluded to before. This one is of Tiffany Bogosian. So Tiffany is George Santos's old high school friend. She's a personal injury attorney, and she just happens to run into George Santos one day. And they just get to talking, and Santos is being Santos. He's boasting and bragging, and she wants to talk about her successes. So she says, ah, yeah, I'm a great personal injury attorney, one of my clients. He just received a $2 million settlement. So what do you think happens in Santos's uh, mind when he hears that? $2 million? I got a great place for you to invest that $2 million. Oh, and don't you believe it? He said, oh, well, why don't you both meet me for dinner? I am just really good at what I do, and I bring record returns, as, as he said in his own words, right? Mm -hmm. So he wants to go out to dinner to wine and dine Tiffany's client, but also Tiffany, to let her know that he's somebody that she can trust. If you're a salesperson for a Ponzi scheme, it's a lot of flash in the pan, but like not a lot of details, right? So I, I'm imagining that this is a really fancy dinner. He's talking about all these great returns, but he's probably not offering a lot of details about the actual business itself, right? Yeah, that would be actually rule number one for all the Ponzi schemers, right? Just tell enough. Don't give all the backstory because if you, well, of course, you're not going to give the full backstory, but you don't want to get lost in the details because you might expose weakness in the investment opportunity. And that's what Santos was good at. And that's what J.P. Maroney evidently saw in Santos. So let me give you a little idea about what happened at that dinner that night. So Tiffany is there with her client, Lopez, and Santos. And Santos, you know, he's not providing any real details of the investment. He does throw out a fairly modest investment opportunity out of that $2 million. He says, hey, you know what? I can 10x your 300 k So he tries to make it sound as if he's not going after the whole $2 million. It's just a small portion of that three hundred, but he's going to provide a 10x return. But you know, Tiffany's pretty darn smart, and she senses that something's not right with this situation. Let's play a clip of uh, Tiffany's interview with CBS News. Tiffany Bogosian, who met Santos when he went by George DeVolder at this junior high school in Queens, says she had other reasons to be suspicious. Bogosian told us she and Santos lost touch until they ran into each other again three years ago at this Starbucks. By then, a New York lawyer, Bogosian says she told Santos about a $2 million settlement she had just won for a client. In response, she says Santos invited them both to dinner. He asked for $300,000 principal investment, and he essentially said the client was not allowed to know what 
was being invested in at all. Her client didn't like the sound of it and turned down Santos's investment pitch. And we now know that that was a Ponzi scheme. It was all fraud. Yeah. One place Santos did work was an upstart financial firm called Harper City Capital, where he was regional director. But after just a year, federal financial regulators at the SEC shut down Harbor City Capital, calling it a classic Ponzi scheme. The SEC complaint did not name Santos, and he has denied any wrongdoing. But after Bogosian and her former client described the dinner meeting to the Washington Post, the SEC reached out to her about Santos and his investment pitch. It's crazy to me now thinking back because, I mean, he's had these characteristics from so young. When Bogosian says Santos was bullied in school. He was trying to be accepted and fit in, and I think he always felt like an outcast. He started these lies, and I think it just continued. And this was the only way that he knew how. Great clip, Javier. You can see Bogosian smelled a swindler, right? So then after the dinner, what does she do? She says to her client, don't invest. She knows something's not right. But Santos's behavior is really interesting after this point because the client, Lopez, started to receive regular pressing emails from Santos saying, hey, come on, do you want to make that investment? Do you want to make that investment? One has to ask, why would Santos keep pressing if he's already gotten a no? Certainly, if the investment were that good, he could just go to frankly, anybody, and they'd probably give him the money. Well, and on top of that, this is a childhood friend that he's trying to screw over, right? I mean, this is not like some random stranger in the street. Like, this is like somebody that he knew and how uh, heartless. It is. And it's like, let me, Tiffany Bogosian, use you and the trust of us being old friends to enable my scheme here. Well, good for Tiffany. I'm glad Tiffany Bogosian did not fall for this. I'm glad her client didn't fall for this. But here we are, Neil. What happens to him and what happens to JP? Did these guys get away with it? You know, a lot of Ponzi schemers do get away with it. Or if they get anything, it's usually civil penalties, maybe a little jail time if uh, the DOJ files an indictment. But right now, George Santos, well, he's out there doing his thing. Maroney, his civil case has stayed, but, well, it stayed pending a criminal investigation. But as of now, there is no indictment. So Maroney is also out there doing his thing, too. Oh, yeah? What's he up to? I was stalking him on the internet. <laughs> and let me tell you. Let me tell you. No, it's called deep research now. Deep research. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So... What I found is, is that he is, yeah, doing just fine. He's on Facebook. He's posting pictures with his family, his wife. He's, you know, looks like they even have some businesses. But we know the backstory, right? If he is being investigated criminally, he's paying lawyers a lot of money right now. So it looks like J.P. Maroney and George Santos, they kind of got away with it. But do you think that the shoe might drop and they might face some criminal charges in the future? I think J.P. Maroney might face an indictment and might face some criminal charges. It's also possible that behind the scenes, he's negotiating through his attorney to agree to some sort of settlement which might end up having him spend some time in jail, one, two years, and having to pay restitution. If there is no indictment and he doesn't face any criminal charges, the Securities and Exchanges Commission will continue its civil case against Maroney, which will result in uh, restitution and other civil penalties. So it's not going to be pretty for Maroney, and it certainly hasn't been pretty for Maroney to date. Now, Santos, on the other hand, that one's a little tougher. I think he's got enough problems out there that this one would just be a little add-on. I actually don't believe that we're going to see a civil lawsuit brought against George Santos because there's just not enough evidence in public record as of today. And if there were any evidence, I think we would have seen it by now. I think so too. But hey, you never know what happens. And George Santos. 
never ceases to amaze us. So we'll have to keep an eye on this one, right? I think we do. And of course, if we do find out that there is a lawsuit brought against him, we'll be uh, certainly talking about that here. That's right. Well, we did it, Neil. We made it to the end of our very first episode of Ponzi (laughs) Playbook. Yeah, we did it. Yeah. Let me tell you, I hope the listeners really enjoyed this. We are really appreciative that you're here listening to the podcast. I agree. This topic is so fascinating. Wait till you see the list of Ponzi schemes that we have cooking for you guys. So if you enjoyed the show, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Ponzi Playbook or leave us a review on your podcast platform of choice, wherever you're listening to right now. All right, Neil. So we'll be back with a brand new episode of the Ponzi Playbook in two weeks. So stay tuned. Make sure to subscribe and to tell your friends all about the show. And whatever you do, don't start a Ponzi scheme. Hello all, it's Neil McTie here, and I have a special update for you regarding our first episode of the Ponzi Playbook on George Santos and the Harbor City Capital Ponzi Scheme. So we've been following uh, closely the developments around George Santos, and just recently a press release from May 10, 2023 caught our attention. Republican Congressman George Santos of New York is now facing criminal charges. Sources telling CNN's Evan Perez that federal prosecutors have filed charges against the New York freshman and serial liar. He's expected to appear in court as soon as tomorrow. Let's bring in Evan Perez, who's breaking the story. George Santos was indicted. He had been charged with multiple counts, including wire fraud, money laundering, theft of public funds, and making false statements. So the Department of Justice decided it was going to hit a home run with this one. But who's surprised, right? What's particularly interesting is that in the indictment, the Harbor City Capital Ponzi scheme is referred to as Investment Company Number 1, which was the employer of George Santos, who we discussed in the episode. While working at Harbor City Capital, George Santos, according to this indictment, was making $120,000 a year. But yet, he had the audacity to request and receive unemployment benefits. Tisk tisk, Georgie. As of now, Santos remains in the House, with his fellow Republicans refusing to cede his seat, while the Democrats push to oust him. Of course, the charges in the indictment are merely allegations. Santos is presumed innocent unless proven guilty. However, if convicted, Santos faces significant prison time. One of the single counts carries a penalty of up to 20 years. So thanks for listening. Glad we could provide this update. We'll be sure to provide future updates at Ponzi Playbook on Twitter. And I'll close with one thought. It appears our dear George Santos has put the con in Congress. <laughs>